I was playing pro, I was playing special teams. I, I started some games, some games I didn't. There was times where, you know, I got to play, you know, 40%, 50% of the offensive stats, but I was on every special team. Well, yep. you reach a point where it had been five years, I kind of lived my dream and I knew I wasn't going to start. So if I was going to stay, I was going to be a, maybe on a, a special teams for another two, three years. And again, if you're running down kicks for the Kansas City Chiefs or the 49ers for a million dollars a year, you know, um, yeah, you, you're going to you're gonna go until you can. It was just time, a time where I, I, I saw that I'd gone as far as I could go. You need an ego to achieve those goals, but then ego becomes reality where you like, you know what? Yeah, this is who I am. I'm a really good backup. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a solid special teams guy. Mm. I'm not uh, as good as I think I am. It's just it's time to just uh, just be thankful that I had this opportunity and uh, walk away healthy and 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 hopefully um, use f uh, football to help open some other doors. Mm. Right. Welcome to the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 113. I'm your guest, your host, sorry, Jeff Humphreys. Uh, before we get going, just a quick ask. Um, if you liked the show or liked any of the previous ones, please share it with a friend. We're trying to get this in front of more people. Um, today's guest. I, the minute you said yes, dude, I was like, I cannot wait for this one. So uh, please name and who you are. Uh, Tony Spalatini, uh, born and raised uh, Calgarian uh, from uh, Italian parents. Uh, you know, went to St. Francis High School and then the uh, University of Calgary. And then I had the uh, pleasure of uh, playing for my hometown, Stampeders. But before that, got uh, drafted by our mortal enemies, the Eskimos. But uh, <laughs> they gave me a chance and I enjoyed it up there for a couple of years and, and then was able to come home. Amazing. Um, your name has been around the city for a very long time, which is really, this is why I'm, you know, super jacked to actually meet you face to face and hear your story. So, um, like we just talked about, I'd love for you to just go back, wind it, wind it back as far as you okay. want to go. Um, you, you know, all of it, just take, take me back. Oh, so, um, so like I said, you know, after, and after World War II and then, in the, especially in the fifties, there was a huge influx of Italians and, and, and a lot of Europeans immigrating to Canada. So, uh, my parents were the fortunate ones to be able to to come, and Dad uh, came over as a teenager in the in the in the late fifties, uh, and then my mom, who's a little younger than my dad, um, came over in early I think nineteen sixty three or so, and they met at Bonus Park, and uh, <laughs> they got married in uh, sixty four, and I was born in sixty five, so I was born to uh, immigrant parents. I was first generation, and I think um, Jeff, that is the coolest generation because you um, are Canadian, but you're still Italian. And then the whole broken English thing, the whole, um, you know, back then um, you could, uh, you know, bring, um, so our parents, you know, they came from the these small towns where they're self-sufficient, right? And mm -hmm. so they kill their own chickens and excuse me, you know, got their own, uh, butcher their own livestock, you know, pigs yep. or whatever. And yep. that's how you fed the family. So when they come to Canada, they're trying to make money save money so they'd go out to some farms get chickens back then you could you could clean them and, and kill them in your basement you know you'd have pigs hanging in your garage so you know imagine you know you bring your buddies home from great one and there's this pig hanging in your garage gutted blood draining into i didn't you know friends would look at you kind of funny and uh, wonder what the hell's going on here right but you know or you go to school and you'd have these lunches with, you know, the thick homemade bread and, you know, prosciutto and mortadella capicolo and, and uh, the, the oil and, the, you know, all the, the fixings, roasted peppers. And you didn't realize until junior high you were getting ripped off because you wanted to fit in. So you'd trade that beautiful sandwich for like peanut butter and jam because you, <laughs> you wanted to fit in. And then you're about 13, 14, you realize, holy shit, what was I doing all yeah. that time, you know? But it was that beauty of... Um, you know, being Italian and Canadian that made it, uh, you know, so much fun growing up. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how was it when you, you know, growing up as a youngster, like finding friends, you know, is it? Is um, it you know what, it, what, what, what's difficult is, is like 
because when we lived in Bridgeland, it wasn't as bad. I mean, I only went to to kindergarten and and, and ha- uh, two three months of grade one, and then we moved to the, the at that time the Burbs was Dalhousie, like Fifty Third <laughs> Street was a city limit in mm-hmm. like nineteen seventy one, right? And so, um, and so uh, you know, at, at Saint Angela's down in Bridgeland, it was pretty well ninety percent Italian. So mm-hmm. I think if you were uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian, by, meaning that if you weren't uh, of, a, of a, an Italian descent, you were actually the minority, right? <laughs> but then when I went to, you know, to St. Dominic's in Dalhousie, you know, it, uh, what usually happens is always the, 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 you know, your very first year there, and then they read the class list and, you know, your name isn't Tony, it's Tonino, right? And so teacher butchers that, and then you got all these, you know, other kids going, oh, Tony, you know, or like, you know, making fun of the Italian <laughs> kids or kids, right? Yeah. Never, And then, you know, they get to know you, you become mm-hmm. friends and then, you know, then it's Tony, right? Yeah. Or, or eventually it becomes Spolly or something like that once you get on a team and stuff. Yeah. But, uh. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm, you know, that those early years, you know, especially when we moved to the new area, you know, but then after that, you start playing sports, right? You start playing soccer in the community, you start roughhousing out on the field and that, and it just mm-hmm. met, uh, it was a melting pot. So I had friends that were German, that were from, uh, you know, Kenya, that mm-hmm. were from, you know, all over, all over the place, you know, it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty amazing. Um, how does sport fit in your life back then? Was it um, like your parents just let you figure it out or did they push you one way? So they, they let us figure it out because... My parents, unfortunately, they, mom came over when she was like, uh, you know, 16. And then a year later, she marries my dad at 17, has me at 18. She barely got to be uh, a teenager. Mm-hmm. You know, she was right away. And then she's living not only with her her in-laws, but she's living with her great-in-laws. Like my great-grandparents live with us because the Italian way was the um, uh, the oldest son to would 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 take care the par- the parents would live mm. with him so I I, I I I got raised with my grandparents and my great grandparents which was which was Amazing. beautiful right so sport really wasn't something they could comprehend they were all about hey we got we got to earn a living here mm. we got but having said that they never stopped. Uh, me, I would just come home and say, "Hey, you know, I want to play soccer. I want to do this. I want to do that." And uh, they didn't know uh, the the rules. They didn't know what it was, but uh, they covered the fees. They um, they fed my teammates uh, <laughs> uh, when they could because uh, you know they were working a lot back then. They, you know, catch as many games as they could. But uh, even though they didn't understand it, they were just happy that I that I was happy, mm-hmm. Jeff. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. And. And then what really gravitated us, uh, we were talking about it earlier, was the Frizanis. And um, they were legends in, in, in Bridgeland. And, uh, you know, Tom, Joe, and, and John. And uh, three brothers. Uh, uh, Joe went to St. Mary's because St. Francis wasn't built yet. And, and then John and, and Tom went to St. Francis. And then the three of them all went to Utah State. And then the three of them all played for the Stampeders and all got to play together, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Those were our idols growing up in in Bridgeland because we could relate. Those were uh, first generation uh, mm-hmm. kids just like us, but uh, you know, gener- like you know, ten years, you know, fifteen years older, yep. that uh, played a sport, uh, played at the university, and now they're playing for our favorite team, the the Stampeders. So Tom and I, um, you know, we really looked uh, up. A lot of the guys in the neighborhood really looked up to them. Mm. Yeah, um, seeing that like up close and personal, like same neighborhood, same kind of background. Just like idolize these, oh, these guys, like it, just totally. And 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 the thing was that um, I, th- I think all three of them, uh, you know, student taught too. Like I never got student taught by by Joe or or Tom Frizzani, but uh, a couple of my my, my older buddies uh, when they were at uh, uh, I think at. at, at at junior high or high school, they they had um, I think Joe Frizzani sub in or something, and then. Mm. Uh, I think my buddy Frank, when he was in grade one, Tom Frizzani was in grade nine because I think St. Angela's at that time was still one to mm. one to or K to nine, you know. And so to hear them say that, you know, you know that you had these guys um, uh, be able to teach you, you know, throw the football at recess. What was really cool was in, when we lived in Dalhousie on Delhart Road, the the crescent behind us. Um, Tom Frizzani for a bit lived with uh, John. Uh, Sorry, Joe Pasarchuk at the time. Do you remember Joe Pasarchuk? <laughs> yeah. He was probably infamous. Him and Larry Zonka, the fumble <laughs> oh, yeah. the, where they had the game one against the <laughs> Eagles there. And I think it was um, that grumpy safety now that used to coach Arizona State picked it up and ran it back. I think um, Herman Edwards, I think, <laughs> okay. might have. Anyway, but that's besides. But anyway, but those guys used to live kind of 
you know, uh, b- behind us and mm-hmm. the cul-de-sac. So to, to see them, you know, every, you know, try and get you a glimpse of those guys, mm-hmm. you know, Pisarczyk and Tom and, mm-hmm. and now Tom Frizzani and is a real good friend. Cause you know, alumni, we, it doesn't matter what area you're, you're pretty close. And yep. yeah, so that was pretty neat. Just it gave you hope because mm-hmm. you knew that someone from your own neighborhood was able to do it and maybe we could we mm-hmm. could do it too. Um, you've talked about it a couple of times already is the, the culture around food. Oh. How, how does that, how does that, you know, at, at a young age, did you realize, you know, the sandwich story, you obviously didn't realize what you're yeah. getting, but like, you know, is, is it the, the Italian vision that a lot of people have of like weekends and oh, family, family it, meals? And oh, like, it, 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 it was everything because especially in those days, you know, my, my grandfather was still working. My dad was working. My mom was working and my grandma and obviously my great grandpa and great grandma were the ones at home. And so they were kind of holding the fort. And then when mom had, uh, had myself and then, and my siblings, then she ended up staying at home. But for, for the, for a while there, she was also working and contributing, you know, to the Mm -hmm. household. So really the one, uh, day that uh, was was sa- well, I mean, dinner was obviously very very special. But Dad, a lot of times, would eat after we'd go to bed because construction was huge, and he'd come home late. But mm. that's why you know Saturday nights and especially Sunday was very important because Sunday was a day that everybody uh, was at home. Mm. And with Italians, uh, you visit when you eat. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that Manascolo bit where back in the day the doors were open. And so if somebody just walked up to your, your house, Hey, come on in. And your mom uh, would always have extra food and, and, and what have you. And they'd come in and, and you, you would just, you know, play and eat and what have you. Now you fast forward to today's day and age where maybe we're not as, a, it's like there's a ring on the door, quick, shut off the lights, you know, dive under the, <laughs> you know, the man of jokes about yeah. that. But in, at, at that time it was all, especially in the Italian culture and maybe a lot of cultures, the the sharing breaking bread was 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 where you 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 told stories you mm-hmm. fought mm-hmm. you you did everything right mm-hmm. and so uh, for us even to this day even with my family and my kids um you know eating together you know at least once a week or if you if you're fortunate enough every night but at yeah. least a couple of big family dinners mm-hmm. one one a week or something is where there's a lot of love a lot of stories uh, really um, where you get to get close mm-hmm. yeah. Um, it's funny cause my, I've told the story on a, for another episode, but my neighbors growing up, uh, the last name is Baffa. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Albina, yeah. Albino, Albino, yeah. And and they, yes. Yes. So yeah. Right beside my house. So every Sunday when they, when they start cooking, <laughs> I know, it was okay. like waft out of the windows <laughs> and just over like, right, like right over the fence. And I was, I, I, I like drooled, I just smelled the red sauce and smelled all. Well, it, and it, 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 what's crazy is, so when we moved to Dalhousie, um, on, the, on the corner was a, uh, was a really nice man. And my mom and dad ended up baptizing, um, their youngest son. And it's actually Umberto's tailoring, uh, compadre Umberto. So Umberto lived next door to us and he was a tailor, beautiful man. And then there was our house. And then there was my cousin Tom's house, my, my aunt Anna, my uncle Ernie. And then two houses down from them was my mom's brother, my uncle Frank. So we almost had our own little Italian. And so what would happen is everybody would at night after work, whatever, they'd come and we had like a front porch and Italians talk loud, right? Jeff, they talk loud and, and, and they move with their hands. So about two or three years, our neighbor comes over from across the street and he says to my mom, Aurora, what's with you guys? My mom goes, what do you mean, Jim? He says, well, I get my cup of coffee and I'm sitting on the, the deck here watching you guys and I'm waiting for people to just start punching and kicking because you it sounds like you guys are fighting you know you're loud and you're you're you you sound aggressive and then right when I think things are going to break out you guys all kiss and hug and everybody goes home and my mom says we just we just talk loud that's all it is right it's just it's just you know it's loud and it's it's you know passionate but Mm -hmm. uh yeah there's no no fist flying no (laughs) so much fun um so take me through like junior high and high school what are you up to and um so, so junior high, I ended up going like, so St. Dominic's was just down my street in Dalhousie. And then I went to, uh, uh, at that time it was called Brebeuf Junior High because uh, uh, St. Jean Brebeuf wasn't, uh, wasn't sainted yet. And, you know, the missionary and our, and our school was, um, Brebeuf was right beside the, the public school, so Winston Churchill. Mm-hmm. So, and so, uh, so Brebeuf kind of encompassed the kids from, you know, Dalhousie. And then there was already the kids from like Brentwood and, 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 and 
uh, Tridwood went, I think, went to um, St. Margaret's. But, you know, mo- part of the Northwest went to Bray Buff. So yeah. now you meet a whole new group of uh, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of people, which is great. You know, uh, really important, uh, you know, being at, we enjoyed sports, so we played, you know, the school sports, right? Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, even volleyball, <laughs> you know, because that was the, you know, you play Bantam football and then your school sport was volley, you know, volleyball in the fall yeah. and then, you know, basketball in the winter mm-hmm. and then you do some track and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what have you and, and stuff. So, you know, the whole, um, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the junior high sports kind of took you to that next level. Cause now you're actually not just playing intramurals like mm-hmm. in elementary school, mm-hmm. you're actually playing other junior highs. You're going to tournaments, right? Mm-hmm. It was really, really cool to be part of that. And then, you know, you're going through that hormone <laughs> stage too, right? Where, you know, you start getting interested in, uh, you know, in girls and yeah. stuff. And, and, uh, so I've got a lot of, um, a lot of really, really good friends from those junior high years that even to this day, we were still, mm. you know, very close because we had such a an awesome um, uh, a, a group of people that, at that time that I was able to go to school with. What was beautiful is there really uh, wasn't a lot of bullying at that, mm. at least at, for that era that I was there. Yep. Um, people were really um, uh, accepting of, of everybody's kind of uh, culture and race and that I, I felt really privileged that I grew up with some really, really nice people mm. at, uh, at Bray Buff. And, and so, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt. Like whenever there was a potlucks and that, my mom would send over a pizza, you know, for the, for whenever you had to have a school function. And, and, and it, it was crazy because most Canadian people thought that pizzas were round. Mm-hmm. My mom would send them in, I'm sure you saw them at the bathroom, yeah. send them in those big square for baking sure. sheets. And they're like, what the? <laughs> so, but that's the way they, they used to do them at home. They were going to make, they just make a big, big sheet, you know? And, and so, so I was pretty popular because my mom could cook like crazy, you know? And so. <laughs> Um, is football starting to be a thing at this age or are you still kind of? Yeah, no. So what, so what's, what's weird, Jeff, is that at that time there was only Bantam football. And so, uh, Bantam football was, um, you know, you could start in grade seven. So you, you, it was basically from like, uh, 12 or 13 years old to 15 years old, but there was just Bantam. So I didn't play in grade seven, grade eight, because I was into playing soccer. But in grade nine, I played one year of Bantam and then went to high school. Mm. What's happened is over the years now, we have Adam football, which is um, uh, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, 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 eight, nine, and 10-year-olds. We have peewee football, which is 11 and 12, and now Bantam, which is 13 and 15. So what's, what's unbelievable is with a certain organization and one that I was able to coach with for years and my boys were there uh, with the Cowboys, mm-hmm. you get a child from eight years old and then we have like a spring league too, shortened spring league um, uh, where the guys from high school can all go back and play with their community buddies, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can be with the association for 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that, that that's pretty cool how it's evolved. But, but back in the day then, uh, Jeff, there was a weight limit in Bantam. So you had to, you had to weigh 160 and under. So my cousin Tom, couldn't play Bantam football because when, you know, he was in grade nine, he was like over 200 pounds. Uh, my, my part, our partner, Mike Palumbo, at that time he went to Bishop Kid. We didn't know him until like uh, high school, you know, we got okay. to know him in high school and stuff. Uh, but Mike was, so it was weird because, you know, football, which is a sport that's meant for big kids, uh, the big, the really big guys just couldn't, they wouldn't let him play because mm-hmm. there was this 160 weight limit. So, I was always hovering on that 160. So we used to play out of Mawada. Remember the old oh, Mawada yeah. stadium? <laughs> so you go down there and I'd have to, like an hour before the game, I'd have to run with garbage oh, bags. No, just uh, yeah, just, to, just, you know, like me to me and about two other guys from some other teams were running. You get on there. 159. Okay, you're good to go. And then you just start like a like a fighter after weighing, and then you just start down in chocolate bar, chocolate bars or a nice prosciutto sandwich or mortadella sandwich, and then you know go play your game. And but then over time now, um, there's no weight limits on the on the lines. Mm-hmm. But in fairness, there's a weight limit at uh, in the skill positions because yep. you got a, a a young man or woman who's you know grown and really 
jacked uh, in grade nine that's mm -hmm. 100 and or even 200 pounds mm -hmm. well they're gonna run over everybody for so sure. i think there's a there's a weight limit for for this like i said for running back yeah. or what maybe 185 but on the old line now it's good you can get these big dudes there and they can actually play <laughs> yeah, you know they, so they have fun so bantam football was uh was a lot of fun you know you get to wear you know put on the equipment mm -hmm. what have you mm -hmm. and then you know um saint francis so saint francis was was legendary, right? It was like yeah, the was. right. It, it was like the 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 De La Salle of uh, of of Calgary uh, football, and uh, so there was these generations before you that were winning city championships. I got to play for Gary Deman, a legend. And at Francis, what was really cool, Jeff, is you didn't get a jacket unless you won the cities. Mm, so those if you brown didn't, if you, ones, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you didn't win the city championship. You didn't get a, a, a the molten leather jacket with the leather sleeves because uh, Coach Deman believed only champions deserve to wear jackets, right? So when you saw these older guys, um, you know, four, five, six, seven, even up to ten years old, and you wearing all these different era of, mm -hmm. you wanted one of those jackets, mm -hmm. you know. So that made it uh, really, you know, that really drove you to go get your own your mm -hmm. own jacket, you know. So mm -hmm. so get you know going to Francis, you know, being able to to carry that dream, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and um, you know, I was lucky enough to we won the cities a couple of years when you I was did. there. Yeah, in grade eleven and twelve. Okay, and uh, grade ten though was a debacle. It was the, <laughs> the remember the strike in nineteen eighty, yeah. and so it was just a Catholic league, and so Bishop Carroll had this really good team, and they put in the wishbone. No one ever had seen the wishbone. So my cousin Tom was in grade twelve. He was on the senior team. I was on the junior team. And our junior team was probably at that time one of the worst junior teams in a long time. We didn't even make the playoffs, and it was just all Catholic schools, right? So it was pretty humbling. Then our senior team gets to the cities and just gets shellacked by by Carroll because we couldn't stop the mm -hmm. the wishbone. You know, either you can fake it to the fullback, the quarterback can keep it, or he can pitch it, right? And they had some great athletes, Carroll, on that team. A bunch of them, we ended up being teammates in uh, at, on the dinos, okay. and so I have that jacket of that championship Bishop Carroll team in a frame at Spalumbo's. Those guys brought me as a gift, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I got it. But I got it in that, you know, that back boardroom we yep. got there. I keep it over there out of respect for, <laughs> for some, some buddies of mine. But so, yeah, it was, you know, you, you, you know, that, that kind of, that loss there kind of broke a, a streak of about seven, eight years in a row. And then the next year later, when I was in grade level, grade 11, we were able to win it back grade 11 and 12. Mm. And then I think, they might have lost another one, but then they went on another mm -hmm. another role again. Mm -hmm. So it, the school's got an incredible history, you yeah. know. And yeah. uh, uh, the important thing what Mr. Demand taught us, Jeff, was he, um, you know, now you know maybe for health reasons, uh, safety reasons, but we we never took off our helmets. Um, there was no names on the back of the jerseys because he said we're all. No individuals here, you know. Mm -hmm. So we really, he focused on team, yep. focused on respect. Um, after the game, we get on the bus, we're quiet until the other team leaves. And once the other team leaves, then we could sing, you mm -hmm. know, on the way home. Mm -hmm. It was always about being humble mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of life lessons, you know. And um, one game, uh, we started singing a little bit too early and... Um, a certain individual, I won't mention any names, <laughs> starts singing his uh, McLean and McLean, right? I've seen, you know, um, he stops the bus. He just goes ballistic on us. And uh, when we get back to the school, during practice, we'd always finish by running the hills. Mm -hmm. Well, never after a game, but he was so livid. He made us run hills after the game because he was so disappointed. Mm -hmm. And uh, a life lesson that I learned was um, never lose your composure, always be humble. Mm. And, uh, you know, a whole bunch of us have kept that, uh, with us our uh, whole lives, you know? Is it, um, did you know you were learning those kind of like impactful lessons at that, at that age? Um, I, I don't, you know, you make a good point. I don't think, I don't think you, you really co it's not cognizant, but mm. you just realize that, that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't cool. You know mm. what I mean? Like, mm. you know, going forward, this isn't, this isn't, uh, one, we got, I don't want to run hills, yeah. you know, but, yeah, yeah. but I, I, you know, 10, you know, you know, when it really hits you, Jeff is like 10 years later when mm. you're, you know, you're getting into your, your thirties and, and, you know, there was times we were really mad at coach demand and like, what, a, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and you look back and then, you know, especially after you have kids and then you coach yourself and mm -hmm. you kind of go, man, he's a good dude, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you knew he was a good dude then, but you kind of, it, it really resonates sometimes, not at the time, but, yeah. but 10 years yeah. uh, later. And then I was really lucky because I go from a legend like Gary DeMann to Peter Canellan, 
Like, I mean, one of the greatest, uh, you know, college coaches, you know, um, and so, so a whole bunch of us from St. Francis ended up going over to UFC and uh, with, uh, uh, and then, um, again, melting pot. So the guys you couldn't stand from EP Scarlet or Crescent Heights or wherever, you know, um, they, be they became, uh, your, your teammates now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you start sharing culture, you start, you know, you, you know, you, you become really good friends and, mm -hmm. and, and we were able to, to be successful, you know, there and, and coach demand was sorry, coach Canella was so much like coach demand. They were, mm -hmm. they, they were, um, firm. They were, uh, no guff, but, uh, sense of humor. Actually mm -hmm. coach Canella had a really good sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> um, was university always in your, like your plan? So football was the reason why, you know, and uh, that I went to university because, um, you know, I come from a background where my dad worked uh, construction, right? So I saw a lot of people do well working construction. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think if it wasn't to continue playing football and then my dream was to eventually play pro, I probably would have just went and, you know, um, started uh, – I don't know, uh, um, putting up forums or, yeah. you know, sort of like a, a prep crew or, mm -hmm. or something. Cause there was good money in that. It's hard work, but good money in that. But yep. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go to that next level. I wanted to play university. And then in the back of your mind, I wanted to, to be like the Frizzani. So mm. football, uh, basically was the reason why I went to, to university mm. and, uh, yeah. And then through that, I uh, met a whole bunch of good friends, uh, had an opportunity to, to play pro ball and that in turn, um, basically set us up mm -hmm. now where with our business and then uh, it's it's such a like we talked earlier it's just all these all these doors that are opening when you were um when you at university did you were you quietly thinking about being a pro ball player or were you kind of focused on school but just like working towards you know what I, I i i jeff I could, I could have been a better student um i mean i always uh, managed to 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 stay eligible and i had um you know, uh, decent enough grades, not, 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 no academic, all, all Canadian by, by that, uh, any means, but it was ironic because we were lucky enough to win the Vanier in 83 and 85 and, and those, and, 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 and those two years, the, I, I was, I was always on probation after the season because by the time we get back, it was late November mm -hmm. And you're getting ready for finals, but you just want to, so you're partying, right? So, so I'd lose my scholarship, uh, that, that, that semester. Cause that is C minus average. Then, you know, kick it up in the winter time, get it back. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately in 84, we lost our best team. I personally feel that I ever played on. We lost a heartbreak to Guelph in Guelph in the semifinal. And then Guelph went on to, to, to win the Vanier. Mm -hmm. And then in 85, we went back and we're, we were fortunate enough to, mm -hmm. to, to win it again. But, um, yeah, it's just, you, I wish I, I you know, if there's one thing I, I would take back uh, that I, I wish I would have been a more disciplined, uh, student. Cause I had some teammates that were amazing, that were mm -hmm. in engineering, that were going to practice, that were studying, you know, I, I maybe could have studied a little more, but, uh, you know, if I probably would have given, uh, my school, the same effort I gave playing football, mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, I probably would have, uh gotten a degree because I didn't end up getting a degree. I ended up getting drafted and then I just never went, uh, I never finished. Yeah. Um, are you okay? Does that haunt you at all? Like, you know you what? I, I, you know, Jeff, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed because I think it's the one thing that I started that, mm. that I never finished, you mm. know? So, you know, um, so I, I know I tell my kids, you know, my oldest, um, you know, uh, got his degree and he's working. Uh, my middle guy, um, you know, got a, a diploma and he's working. And uh, my youngest guy's in the process of finishing his degree. So mm -hmm. I really can't get on their case because they can just turn around and go, well, Dad, you never, <laughs> you never finished, you know. So that's the one thing, uh, Jeff, I regret. I just, I wish I would have been a, a better student. I had a blast. Mm -hmm. I mean, the university opened a lot of doors. Yeah. And I, and it's a shame because I was about a year, you mm, know. You're right there. Right. But, uh, but yeah, that's the only regret. Um, the culture around winning. To win, to win two Vanier Cups, Does, do those experiences stick with you? Like, oh, you... it. Um, if you look at that group of guys, because we had our forty this past October, uh, so it was, uh, yeah, twenty twenty three, we had the fortieth uh, anniversary, and so um, knock on wood, um, we haven't lost a lot of guys. We lost a close, close dear friend, Tim Petros, uh, mm. a couple of years earlier, and. Uh, Timmy to this day still has the Vanier rushing record in that game against Queens. And, but a whole bunch of the guys were there and, and the, 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 the final dinner we had on a Saturday night at the Italian club and 
we had the tables structured where they were in a big square and there was about 35 of us there and the coaches and, and we're all facing each other. And, and what ended up happening, Jeff, was kind of organic, but beautiful. Somebody started something on the mic and then they just passed the mic mm. all the way down. And about two hours later, you had guys pouring out their hearts of what that team meant to them and, and, and what happened to them while they were there and how coach Canell and that coaching staff got a whole bunch of misfits and guys that maybe weren't wanted before. And, 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 and some young guys like myself who were just coming out of high school and put us all together and created this awesome, um, this awesome, uh, group of guys. And, and, and I look at that team now, it spurned so many quality high school coaches in the cities, like mm -hmm. Joe Stambini, Darcy Cop, you know, Wade Buto. There's a, uh, you know, bunch of quality guys that are, that are, that are teachers. There's a bunch of qual guys that Brian McCauley used to teach, a bunch of guys that went on to be successful in oil, a bunch of guys who, who went on to be successful in law and some became, you know, doctors. So there is some merit to success in athletics translating mm -hmm. to success in life because, and not only are these guys successful in their careers, but a lot of them were just are great dads, great husbands, they give back to the community. And so th there's a correlation between, you know, uh, winning teams and then uh, being successful after the fact. Mm -hmm. So, so proud to see a lot of the guys uh, doing great. And we all stayed close. I'm sure you don't get to, mm -hmm. to see each other, but uh, when you have a food place, it makes it easy because groups of guys all, you know, the DBs come in once in a while. And you get a couple of guys. So I'm lucky because they can pill, kill two birds with one stone. They can come and get some lunch. Mm -hmm. And then they can visit, you know, and then we, and you, and, and what's weird, Jeff, is you don't remember until maybe like you give me a trigger or if I see one mm -hmm. of my teammates and right away, boom, a road trip comes to mm -hmm. mind or, or a certain mm -hmm. game, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, what's really special. Um, so university, you get drafted to go play. Yeah. So it's a win early. So, um, so, you know, go going into the, the draft, uh, you don't know what to expect. So. The draft starts and it's round one, round two, round three, nothing's happening. So I'm figuring, okay. And, and, and I, I, I figured I had a shot because back then, now they're more open to playing Canadians everywhere. Mm. But in, in, you know, in the seventies and eighties, um, it was more like you had the American positions, the Canadian positions. So your Canadian positions were O-line, D-line, safety, slot back and fullback, right? They always put a Canadian at fullback so that way they could have maybe an extra American receiver, you know, it was, but the fullback was usually a Canadian and the tailback at that time was American. Mind you, there was Orville Lee at that time who was great. And so, and as you'll see with uh, John Cornish and a bunch of these great Canadian backs now, um, they've gotten away from that. They actually, some teams go with just Canadian running backs, mm -hmm. but so I figured, okay, you know what? Um, there's a market for fullbacks, you know, I thought I was okay at that time, you know, uh, very successful college career. Our team was good. And and I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and it goes down to the sixth round. And um, so basically I, I end up becoming at either Edmonton's last pick or second last pick. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think your ego's a little hurt, but it's an opportunity, right? And mm -hmm. so, and then, you know, it was the Eskimos, but then you figure, you know what, hey, it's an opportunity to to play pro. So um, I got that opportunity. I went up there. I don't think they um, expected me to make it because they're, they're fist First pick overall was Blake Marshall. You remember the big? Oh yeah. And so we had beaten those guys in the Vanier in '85. Mm. So when I get to camp, he's looking at me. I'm looking at him all this because, you know, Western, right? We're going, oh yeah, Western. <laughs> you know, so, but not. But Blake was a stud. Like he was six two, two thirty. He was a Heck Creighton winner, which is the equivalent of the Heisman mm -hmm. Trophy in Canada. So he's their number one pick. I'm kind of like their second last. And they they'd gotten a whole bunch of. Um, they drafted about two or three Canadian backs in between because at that time, the Eskimos were the only team that were using all Canadian backs. They had Chris Skinner, uh, Chris Johnstone, and Milson Jones. Mm -hmm. So they went with three, and all three of those guys were were studs. So they could they could play Americans maybe on defense or at receiver. Yep. So they needed you know good young Canadian backups for that. So they drafted about four Canadian backs. So as training camp went on, exhibition game went on, it just became where they just ended up. Uh, well, obviously they were going to keep Blake because he, he was their first round pick. And I ended up um, sticking around. Mm. So a funny story there. So we go to the second exhibition game. And so they they uh, they let uh, 
Skinner and uh, Milson Jones stay at home because they're, you know, and so they take uh, myself, Blake, and Chris Johnstone. And so, you know, Blake and I get a half a game each. So this is my chance to, mm-hmm. to, to shine, to try and stick on the, on the team. So we get back and our coach at that time, remember Jackie Park, Jackie, the legend, Jackie Parker yep. was our head coach. So after that game, uh, we're waiting, you know, for the list to come out and see who got cut or whatever. And, and I go to, to, uh, rundown or whatever. And Jackie Parker comes up to me and he says, uh, son, he says, uh, you, you hurt your ankle real bad in that game. So you're going to limp around for a couple days and then you're going to just start practicing again. If the press asks you what happened, you just say you, you had some severe ligament damage. I go, no, no coach, I'm fine. He goes, no, no, you don't understand, boy. You, you, you hurt your ankle. I go, no, I didn't. He goes, son, he goes, we don't want to release you because you'll get picked up. He says, so I want you to fake it and we're going to put you on IR and, uh, cause we want to keep you around and stuff. So I said, okay, I was ecstatic. Right. And, and Jeff, you know, so it was great. Cause on IR you get your full salary, mm-hmm. but you know, you don't get to play in the games. And back then when you went on, it was 11 weeks. Right. So it wasn't like now where it's like one week or two week if yeah. they, they, cause they didn't want teams hiding a whole bunch of, so as much as it was really cool making the team, but I, I never, in that 87 year, I never, you know, played in a, in a game. I was just kind of like a healthy scratch the whole, the whole, you know, the whole year, but it was still a awesome experience. And, and, uh, but just Jackie, cause I was so naive. He was just telling me, you know, you're going to limp around mm-hmm. and, uh, and then you know, after two or three days, just start practicing again. <laughs> um, would you actually make it? <clears throat> Does it actually, um, are you happy enough that you just made it or do you want to like push? Do you want to actually try to achieve something? So you, you want to, you, you definitely want to achieve because if you don't, um, then you're done. So not only that, once you make it, then I want it to start. So mm. I wanted to eventually, you know, beat out, you know, Blake or beat out, uh, even though they were my friends, we we're all good friends, yep. friendly, you know, you, you just, you just don't want to. You know, first you want to get on the field and contribute any way you can, special teams, what have you. And then after that, you eventually want to gravitate to, to, excuse me, to starting. Yep. So, so then that was, you know, 87 where I spent that year on, um, an IR and, and then when I came off IR, they put me on the practice squad, but I've, you know, finished off the year and they were really nice because they, excuse me. They gave me a, a great cup ring, even though they I didn't play in a game. In 87. Oh, yeah, no we won way. in 87. Yeah, the okay. one where Jerry Corrick kicks the, uh, against Toronto in BC Place, hmm. kicks the winning field goal at the end. So, you know, I, hey, I, you know, I, I feel, you know, I, I was there, I worked hard, I, I, I made the other guys better, but um, yeah, so they were really nice and they gave me a, hmm. a, a great cup ring. I mean, I don't, I don't wear it because I, I didn't play in, in, in yep. any games and that, but it's just something to have as a, hmm. as a nice memento of that year. So I come back in 88 and then 88, I, you know, I become, um, on the, I, I'm a reg, I'm on the roster now and I'm mm-hmm. playing special teams. I'm coming in on short yardage. And then, you know, a few games I got to, to start cause, uh, you know, um, Blake got banged up and, and what have you. Mm-hmm. And so, but that's what you strive for. So at the end of that year, I became a free agent and just saw that, um, you know, Things there seemed to be pretty locked up. Yep. There was an opportunity to come home, so I wanted to come home and and uh, and see if I couldn't uh, compete at home. And so mm. I came back home, and then I, I you know I finished off the my career eighty nine, ninety, ninety one with the Stampeders and stuff. Yeah, mm. um, playing in your own backyard. Yeah, that was my my dream. As much as I loved, Ed, you know, I, I really got to know Edmonton, a beautiful city, great mm-hmm. people, great fans. Uh, but you, when you have an opportunity to, to come home, it was, it was, you know, I always wanted to be a, mm-hmm. a stampeder, right? Mm-hmm. So to, to be able to play on the team of the three guys, like the Frizzanis that I idolized mm-hmm. and that I grew up watching and mm-hmm. yeah, my own backyard. Yeah. It was, it was out of this world. Yeah. What do, um, what do your parents think about that when you come home and play for the stamps? Do they, does it like, do they, do they appreciate what that actually oh, means? They, they were, uh, they were so proud. And I mean, Tom ended up going pro before me, my cousin, Tom. Mm. So, so to be able to even play with him was, was amazing. So, you know, you think of the odds of one person in the family making pro. Now you got two, you know, you're two, two, and the Frizzani's had three, right? Three mm-hmm. brothers. And mm-hmm. so, so it was kind of cool to be able to, cause then when we were playing against each other, a funny story. So my, my rookie year, we're playing Calgary in, in the exhibition game, the first exhibition game. And so I get the last, um, 
I get the fourth quarter. And so we're playing against the Stampeders. And uh, so I get in that game and, and uh, you know, they want to see what I can do. So they, they give me a draw and they, they throw me a screen. And, and then late in the game, I, I catch a, a pass over the middle and then we kick a field goal and we end up, you know, beating them. But while I'm, you know, I, I break a run or I make a good catch, Tom, Mike, and, and the, the Timmy Petros, they're all cheering for me, right? Because they want me to make the team. And you remember the crazy Larry Koherick? He was a, the coach at the time. Okay. Right? Yeah, Coach Q. He looks over and goes, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> You're cheering for the other team. They go, well, it's Tony. He goes, I don't give a shit. You know, but yeah, but we want him to make the team, right? So it just shows you blood is thicker than water. So, mm -hmm. I mean, mind you, if it was a regular season game, I doubt it. But, you know, exhibition game, the mm -hmm. boys were just kind of, so yeah. So I'd, I'd make a run and these guys like, yeah. And then everybody on their bench is going, what's the matter? with you guys man like it uh but that just um yeah that i always remember that as being you know pretty cool you know and mm -hmm. so um yeah but to, to come back and to play with tom but at that time we had a lot of dinos on the stampeders too there was Stu laird there was darcy cop there was my cousin tom um you know and and then our, our our partner and good friend mike palumbo who had played at washington state but he was on the stampeders you know mm -hmm. what i mean there was there was uh Greg Peterson, who went to EP Scarlet, mm -hmm. BYU, he was on the Stampeders, you know. There was uh, there was probably seven, eight guys that played Calgary High School football that were on the, the team at that time. And, you know, the the Stampeders should actually market this, but it, it, for every year that they've been in existence, there's been at least one Calgary senior that's that's played for the stamp, meaning that maybe not in, in one era, but like if they, they've been around, let's say 75 years, mm -hmm. there's been 80 Calgary high school football players that have worn the red and white. So that's, that's pretty cool for a pro Super team. Cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, um, what are you doing? And you, you and I talked about this quickly, but what are you doing in the off season when you're, when you're playing pro? What so, um, I used to go work, uh, graveling basements cause we, you know, uh, like or, family or, business or, stuff. Yeah. Like my dad worked for Rolly mix. So right. I'd, I'd go work for place concrete for Rolly mix, or there was another gravel business that, uh, my dad and, um, the owners from, from Rolly mix had a piece of, it was a graveling business. So I'd push a wheelbarrow. Like mm -hmm. what's funny is that stuff we used to do then that was work. That's all the stuff that's in the gym now, right? Like mm -hmm. smash the sledgehammer, <laughs> the wheelbarrow that you flip over. But that was, you know, we didn't realize at the time that we were actually working out. You know what I mean? The, the most humbling thing, Jeff, was you go and, uh, you go to work. And so there's these Italian guys there and they're, they're in their fifties. They're some of them in their early sixties. They're smoking up a storm. They're not very big. And, uh, and they're just kicking your butt, mm. uh, uh, finishing, shoveling Wilbert. And they're laughing at you because they go, oh, yeah, football player, you <laughs> lifted the weights. So yeah, yeah, you got two speeds, a stop and a slow, you know, like, a, <laughs> And, and so by the end of the summer, when you actually get into work shape, mm -hmm. you got to go back to, to, to training, you know, back to playing football or what have you. But it just shows you how different, you know, from being in like mm -hmm. fit, like, you know, athletic shape and actually work, mm -hmm. work shape. And mm -hmm. those guys were, oh my God, <laughs> they, they, it was really hum kept me very humbled because uh, they're kicking my ass. You know, here I am. websites playing ball did you have an idea what the, what the out to, was going to look like you know what i probably thought i was going to get into um construction you know because that's what, yeah. what what my dad knew what was ironic the last year um uh off season so I, we'd finished playing 1990 and we're going into the 91 season construction was slow so this is really a uh, cool guy that we met uh, you probably know him alistair smart so alistair was with the original sales men for uh, big rock brewery oh yeah that's what i knew right yeah, okay, so yeah. alistair right yeah so alistair was we're at nick's and uh before a game after a game uh yeah i <laughs> think it was whatever. after we were just that we were there right <laughs> yeah but alistair had had, had um gotten uh nick's to one of the first places to carry uh trad back in uh i think we were still in college so okay. we knew we knew alistair in college you know we okay. met him we met him in college so um so yeah it was that was that nick's and alistair or i ran into alistair somewhere and he says hey uh, what are you doing this off season? I said, well, 
I'm just looking for work because construction's a little slow. He says, listen, we, um, we need somebody at uh, Big Rock to uh, uh, load the kegs onto pallets, and that's good exercise and, you know, something. So I said, sure, I'll go. So at that time, Big Rock was still in their old lo- Supreme uh, mm-hmm. location, and they kind of had like a, the, the, an, an old assembly line where they would wash the, the kegs, they would roll down, they'd fill them, a guy would bung them, and then they rolled down to me, and then I would just stack them on onto um, pallets and then a forklift would take them away. Mm. So I did that for about a couple of weeks and then they said, listen, you know, you're a former stampeder and that, you know, maybe it's pretty cool if uh, we need a swamper on the truck, why don't you go with Rob and you deliver uh, the kegs to, to all the restaurants and that. So I used to ride with this guy, Rob, and we would, you know, uh, load up all the kegs for all the bars, like the Rolls and Crown and all, what have you, the mm-hmm. Earls and that. And we'd go and we'd wheel them into their coolers. And, and, and so that was my, um, mm. my, um, my winter job. What, you know, wouldn't you know it at the end, the people at Big Rock, Mr. McNally was so good to me. The people at Big Rock, they made me my own uh, beer bottles. They took my football card and they made it a label and they made about 24 of, um, of uh, pale ales with, uh, uh, like a like my football card as the label, right? And so I kept this really good relationship so that when we opened uh, Spalumbo's, uh, Alistair, um, Mr. McNally, uh, they were so good that when we moved to our new location, uh, which is the exist this one where we're at now, yep. new location, we've been at this one now for 26 <laughs> uh, years, um, that that we we you know we had Big Rock beer there mm. and uh, but Mr McNally would come to the old deli because he enjoyed because he was an entrepreneur because when he started Big Rock he was a, a lawyer and everybody mm. thought you know doing a micro brewery in, in in Alberta was ludicrous at that time but he not only did it he killed it and look at yeah. what's happened right mm-hmm. so so that that was a fun uh, a fun off season uh, you know being able to deliver uh, beer for mm. for Big Rock you know did you um. Why'd you retire? Did you know his time? Or was so, it- you know, Jeff, how you said when you, um, were you happy just, you know, being, uh, uh there kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. you were happy you made it and, mm-hmm. and playing special teams. Right. So and in every point of my life, I was always kind of like a, a starter. Right. And so, uh, and, and I was lucky enough to, to get to, to pro ball. Right. And, and when I was, I was, when I was playing pro, I was playing special teams. Um, I started some games, some games I didn't, you know, I backed up Andy McVeigh, I backed up, uh, uh, you know, Blake Marshall, but there mm. was, there was times where, you know, I got to play, you know, 40%, 50% of the offensive stats, but I was on every special team. Well, yeah. you reach a point where it had been five years, I kind of lived my dream and I knew, you know, um, you know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to start. So if I was going to stay, I was going to be a, maybe a, on special teams for another two, three years. And Again, if you're running down kicks for the Kansas City Chiefs or the 49ers for a million dollars a year, you know, um, yeah, you, you're gonna you're gonna go until you can because when you're done, you've got you know. But uh, you know what? It, it was it was just time a time where I I I saw that I had gone as far as I could go, and then mm. re- ego you need an ego to achieve those goals, but then ego becomes reality where you like you know what. Yeah, this is who I am. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a really good backup. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a solid special teams guy. Mm. I'm not uh, as good as I think I am, mm. and 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 it's just it's time to just uh, just be thankful that I had this opportunity and uh, walk away healthy and 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 hopefully um, use f- uh, football to help open some other doors. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So those doors. Can you? Uh, how did you start Spalumbo? So. It was actually Tom and Tom and Mike, my cousin Tom and and our partner Mike Palumbo. Um, they had finished a year before me, so that last year ninety one, when I was playing, they had finished after the ninety season, and so that off season, um, Tom's um, 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 in laws, very famous family, the uh, the um, the Tuta family, their, their restaurant uh, geniuses in Calgary. They had Stromboli's, mm. uh, which is now Puccinella's. That's uh, Tom's young brother in law that has that. And and uh, then um, they op- they they opened up um, uh, La Villa Firenze on First Avenue mm. and and what have you. So Tom and Mike were helping um, uh, Tom's father in law uh, renovate this property he just bought because he was just gonna he was gonna open uh, Villa Firenze. So they were doing odds and ends jobs. They were doing some construction. And then finally. You know, Tom and Mike had this idea. Hey, let's. No one in Calgary really does um, 
you know, an Italian sausage. Uh, I mean, the Italian stores do phenomenal sausage, but nobody really markets it to food service or to grocery stores or, or, or what have you, restaurants and that. So out of the basement of the Villa Firenze, um, Tom and Mike started uh, with a strong influence from, Miss, you know, Mama Tuta, Miss, uh, Joe's wife, and, 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 and some influences from our family. But the bulk of the sausage recipe came um, from influence from the Tuta family. And uh, they came up with the spicy and the mild. And so I was done after, I got married um, in the off season of 91. And when, when I came back from my honeymoon, I said, look, I'm done. And so I started joining these guys. And so we would make it early in the morning in the basement of the Villa Forenza with a hand crank, you know, 35. And I'd get a Tupperware and my, and then we'd just go and try and, and flog it to restaurants, right? Mm. And so, you know, little by little. And then this little deli opened up well, this deli came for sale in Inglewood. It was called the Ninth Avenue Deli. And Jeff, it was four blocks west of where we are now. You know where um, Calgary Home Appliance was? Yep. I think now it's a it's a, a burger place with the so and 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 right next door to us was the um uh vet clinic and stuff and and so this Ninth Avenue deli, uh, this guy Lee was looking to sell it and we we thought it was great because it had an old German hydraulic uh, sausage stuffer that you could yeah. fit actually a hundred pounds. So that basically, you know, f increased us five times. Mm. And so we thought, wow, we're moving up, even though this is a 1964 knee, you know, uh, like hydraulic, you know, and, and so, so we'd go in there, like we'd start at two, three o'clock in the morning, you know, we'd stuff all the sausage, you know, Tom would, would go and deliver it. Mike and I would then prep uh, the deli and we'd, we'd work the deli hmm. out of the front just for some extra cash. Like we, there was no intention of having a deli, but there was a deli there and we needed cash flow because we didn't have, um, you know, wholesale uh, hmm. uh, uh, businesses and what, and, and what have you. And so we would stuff the sausage in the morning. Tom would go deliver. Then Mike and I would prep and get ready to make sandwiches out front. When Tom came back from deliveries, the three of us would... Um, would uh, make sandwiches, you know, and then we clean it up, and and uh, and it was funny because uh, <laughs> I don't know if you ever met our teammate Marshall Toner. So never, Mar Marshall's yeah. a very funny guy, but he's like the the guy that's always busting everybody's chops, right? So he'd come in there, and we have a bit of a lineup. Hey, no, excuse me, how do you three fat? Um, you know the Italian <laughs> adjective yeah. with W. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, how do you three fat fit behind that <laughs> counter? It looks like you need to put that olive oil between each other, not just on that sandwich, you know. So, and then everybody started laughing, right? That's a kind of, um, but but what was really cool was, you know, that's what helped us was all our teammates would yeah. come down and and um, in '92 uh, when the remember when the Eskimos uh, uh, beat us uh, when Fru Flutie's hands froze, yeah, and, yeah. and so that was the. Sorry, that was ninety three. Sorry, ninety three, because ninety two they won in yeah, they won in in um, against uh, Winnipeg and Toronto. But in ninety three, even better team. Remember, Flutie, we 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 lost it, and then mm -hmm. um, Edmonton ended up winning it in our own. Uh, so a bunch of my old teammates from the Eskimos were still on that ninety three team. So they 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 phone up and they spot like, can you do us up some pasta and stuff like that? We're gonna for the old line. So the old line would come down after hours and so we'd make them some pasta at the old deli and stuff like that and so it was it was kind of nice to see those guys and then whenever those guys would uh would come into town uh they'd order sandwiches and then when the bc lions would come into town they'd order sandwiches so that's the the the, the football community is so yeah. supportive right and mm -hmm. so even you know it was just like if you knew a guy on another team had a a restaurant mm -hmm. if you stayed the night or the night before you go and you'd go and patronize that restaurant because he's like a a brother in the yep. business you know what i mean yep. and that's a another beauty of sports jeff is is uh the the support for each other right mm -hmm. on the field knock your head off off the field you know what we're hey we're gonna have a beer together yeah. you know what i mean yeah. yeah so did you um was it a natural progression to start your own like to be a part of that crew to start start a business did it feel like a natural fit or were you like this is temporary you, you know what it, it just felt like another another chapter. So whenever in high school, your goal was, okay, I'm going to make the team. Once I make the team, I want to start, right? And then university, I'm going to make the team and then I want to start, you know? And then, and so this this felt like it was just like I was trying out for another team, mm -hmm. like, because we're all young and, um, you know, uh, if it didn't if it didn't work out, we're going to give it our best shot. And if it didn't work out, then you know what we're gonna you know lick our wounds and just just you know move on and mm -hmm. and you know for the first three years, Jeff it was really uh, really tough. So 
I've, I've, what I want to say to entrepreneurs is it, it, don't give up because you could have a phenomenal idea and it might take three, five, maybe sometimes even longer. Like, so, you know, the first, uh, I think it was what, first couple of years, we didn't even take salary. We're living mm -hmm. off our money we had saved and some yeah. RSPs and that kind of thing. And then, you know, by year three, we, I think we were drawing just enough to pay the bills, mm -hmm. you know, and really it took till about year six, seven, eight, until we started yeah. seeing any money close to what we were making playing football. And then probably year 10 to start saying, okay, this is why yeah. we got it. We got into this. Yep. So, cause you've got, um, you know, you got to pay your suppliers, you got to pay your employees. You know, my dad always said, make sure you pay all your suppliers, all your employees, if there's anything left for you. Right. And so I think we were getting on the verge of, um, maybe, and then doors open like we got a a great review uh from this wonderful lady kathy richard j we lost her a couple of years ago she wrote about uh, the spalumbo special and the meatloaf and then mm -hmm. the next thing you know the next day the place was lined up and then the people that turned us away because our sausage is gluten-free it's um the, the 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 really good cuts like the pork shoulder uh we use boneless skinless uh uh turkey and chicken meat and uh, with with chicken breast meat mixed in so and and then there's no additives no preservatives so we want it to be different sausages yeah. were normally you know the lips the ears that you mm -hmm. name it right mm -hmm. they're all the byproducts and so our sausage was a little more expensive but when you cooked it um it wouldn't shrink it was mm -hmm. really good and so the initial shock because you're new on the block a chef would look and say well you're 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 expensive it, it didn't matter that he liked uh, yeah. the flavor but when you're around one year, when you're around two years, three years, now they start thinking, hey, these guys are sticking around. So then one person gives you a chance. So, you know, Lance, uh, uh, Lance Herdeby. So he was with Moxie's then. So I, <laughs> I show up there and uh, the late Bruce was his manager there, Bruce that used to run Bookers. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, so uh, I knew Bruce from school. And, and so I go, hey, Bruce, can I come down and cook you guys some? So I, and Bruce goes, sure, come on down. And so I show up there and... Uh, and now Lance is a really, really good friend of ours. But at that time, uh, I find out once we became close friends, Lance tells a story. He goes to Bruce, what the hell are you, why are you letting this freaking guy in here, man? And he goes, well, he's a good friend. He goes, what the fuck do we, excuse me, why do we want sausage? Look at, the, he's coming here in the Tupperware. Bruce goes, just let him cook it up for you, man. Come on. Okay. So I go there and Lance is being really polite. And then we cook it up. Uh, he likes it. And next thing you know, Lance, uh, you know, gave us a shot. Um, mm. Nick at, at Nick's gave us a, a, a shot, like, you know, family, right? Tim, Nick, those guys gave mm -hmm. us an opportunity. And then slowly, uh, you know, you get into a few places and uh, we started doing the Millerville market, you know, mm -hmm. try and get exposure. And then, you know, people recognize the quality. And then, and then again, like I, it comes full circle, the story, three former football players with this deli and, and sausage and, and what have you. And then, um, then Tom says, you know, we got to get, uh, we either going to, stay the same or we got to get bigger. And so where we are now, our present location on the corner of uh, 9th Avenue and 12th Street uh, was an old Dino uh, gas station. And Petrocan at the time, um, and then, then they had shut down the gas station. They had taken out the tanks, cleaned it up, and it was just a little uh, corner store, nice little Korean corner store. But uh, Petrocan wanted to get out of, because they owned a bunch of these little properties and they just did, they just wanted to get out of of, of having these because they were no longer gas stations mm -hmm. so we were able to Tommy was able to get on it and buy it from them before all the property values in um Inglewood skyrocketed because probably a year after that Jeff no they went nuts so timing was everything so mm -hmm. we bought um this land off of Petro Canada but we didn't have enough um uh, money. We had enough money to buy the land but then we didn't have enough money to to build a mm -hmm. uh, a new facility so we're still at the old place, obviously. And then every every time we go to bank for a loan, it's like, well, no, you know, it's risky. Your deli, mm -hmm. sausage plant, risky, mm -hmm. risky, risky, risky. And then um, the Frizzani's uh, were kind enough. John Frizzani nominates us for a 1997 Small Business Award. So you start off with a, a large group and then it... Um, you know, whittles down and then yep. we made the, the final four. <laughs> so we're at the, the West End and we're going up against some, you know, some pretty good, um, companies there. And, um, and, and we just ended up just getting one table cause we thought, Hey, this is cool. Even just making it to the final, what have you. And, you know, some of these other companies had two, three tables and what have you. And so next thing you know, the guy gets up there and, and he was, a. Uh, a St. Francis grad, this businessman, he goes, you know, it gives me great pleasure 
this year's um, you know small business award winners are three guys from my high school, uh, two guys from my high school, one from St. Mary. And we're looking at each other, what? You know, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we get up there. And so um, I've always kind of been the front guy. So Mike and uh, Tom looked after wholesale sales. Mikey ran the plant. And I got the, you know, kind of the deli catering in the front because yep. I'm the guy, you know, kind of you know, tells jokes and whatever and, and, and what have you, right? And so Tom goes, you know, say something. And so I get up there and... I, you know, I tell a dirty joke and then he goes, enough. And he pulls me out and, and he goes in there. I like, thank everybody, you know. <laughs> yeah. But what's ironic, Jeff, is after, you know, it was in the paper the next day, you know, Spalombo's win small business. The same financial institutions that wouldn't give us the time of day were now lining up to, uh, mm. so I thank the chamber. Yep. The chamber is amazing for that because they they give you, you know, Cal, you know Calgary in general the, and groups like the Chamber of Commerce, they give you that that little boost yeah. to to credibility to 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 so that you can um get some get some financing mm -hmm. so we got some financing we built the new the new deli the location where we are now it has a a federal sausage facility within a facility so it's kind of cool where we have the deli the kitchen and then there's a back half that's like a separate building within yeah. a building that's a sausage plant and we just produce and then it goes out and then next thing you know Co-op, huge uh, advocate for local uh, uh, businesses. So co-op, you know, uh, Safeway, Sobeys, you name it, food service, you know, GF, all the food service guys have been yeah. so so good to us. And, uh, you know, 32 years later, uh, Jeff, we're, um, you know, fortunate enough to still be doing it. What's, what's it, What I find fascinating is those, those hard years. <clears throat> you know, there's three of you barely making any money, trusting this idea. How do you find the like inner strength to keep pushing? You know, besides like you're not making any money, so there's probably stress financially. Probably qu questioning if the idea or the product's that good. Like, how I do think you, how uh, do you push? Um, I think, and again, not to not to sound like a cliche, I think it's kind of like when you're you're down in a game, and uh, and even if it's close, you you know you can you can come back. But even if you're getting wiped out. So, so those first two, three years was like playing in the fourth quarter when you're down by 30 points, right? Yeah. It's pride. Yeah. It's drive. It's like, Hey, if I, even though maybe we're not winning now, if I, I give up now, we're giving up on ourselves. So again, I think we took those lessons of, um, on the field, those lessons of being in team sports, you know, we were doing that for each other. I mean, I'm sure Tom and Mike felt that if. They're gonna let me down. I felt that hey, if we quit, I'm gonna let them down. And so mm -hmm. we just we just kept uh, plugging away. Like uh, you know, we just put our head down. Next year, reload. You know, the, there's that line: you make a mistake, you fumble, whatever. Reload, and let's just uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, let's get back at her again. You know. Mm -hmm. So I think it was that drive and all those lessons running those hills with Gary Demand. You know, the the life lessons with you know Coach Canal and you know, and um, it was just uh, my, our parents. Let, 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 first and foremost, we had. Um, such incredible support, Jeff, from, mm. from our parents. I'd mentioned, you know, Tom's in-laws, uh, Tom's dad used to go and grab stuff for us. Mike's dad used to come and, uh, debone, uh, pork butts with us. Cause to save money in the early years, we'd get the pork butts with, um, the bones in them. So mm. we'd debone to save money per kilo. Then obviously mm. once you start hitting your volumes, it's counterproductive. So you get them already deboned, yeah. but in, excuse me, in the early years, you know, we had Mike's dad there, you know, uh, my grandpa would come and mm -hmm. he would uh, do anything. He'd, he'd bus. He could even speak English and he'd bus and he'd uh, stock the pop and um, people would talk to him and he'd talk to them in Italian and, and <laughs> they somehow understood him. And uh, so the, 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 the family uh, support and even our wives, like our wives were amazing. We were hardly ever home mm -hmm. and uh, whenever we needed them, they would come help us at the deli or do, you know, some barbecues with us and that. So you get back to family, the mm -hmm. family made us, all of our families, the Palumbo family, the both Spalatini families, the families were a huge part mm -hmm. of the business. It's, um, I like hearing the story just because a lot of people see the, where you are now, you know, they see, they probably don't know it's 32 years, but they see this, this <laughs> so, structure on the corner, right? And it's just like, oh, it's just, and, 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 and that's, you, you make such a great point because in the early years, um, we could never, you, you couldn't go for lunch because 
that's where we made our, you know. So it, it took about 10 years before we actually went out on, um, for lunch with some buddies because now, you know, we we become established. We had some really good staff. So on a Friday now, uh, we, 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 there was an opportunity to go out for lunch. And so we kind of have this neat little club. We call it the Friday Club. So with these, some older buddies of ours, um, you know, Frank Mafrica, you know, Joe Ferraro, um, another buddy, Russ. And so these guys were kind of doing, they're, they're a little bit older than us. One's a successful um, developer in home building. The other guy's doing concrete, you know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. these guys are established and kind of like mentors in that. And they'd come to the deli all the time. Where Frank used to come watch me play, you know, high school football. And, and uh, so we're like family. And so these guys became like older brothers to us. So they invited us for lunch you know, one Friday we go, can we, and so we did. And so, you know, for the last 20 years now, Friday, we go out for lunch. Whenever everyone's in town, we go for lunch, you know, mm. we'll go to the Italian club. We'll go to some other different places around the city and, um, and just let off some steam for a couple hours mm. on a, on a Friday afternoon. You mm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you're right to, 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 in those early stages, that didn't even cross your mind. But what's funny sometimes is someone will see you, on a Friday, well, shouldn't you be at your play? What's what's this? So, oh, you decided to go somewhere else for some good food? Yeah, okay, heard that line before. You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's a joke, but sometimes mm-hmm. you almost feel like you know Jeff like saying, um, "Hey, you know what? It, this is this is thirty two years in the making. Mm-hmm. This is this is a couple hours here to just kind of, and this didn't happen um, right off the bat because my dad always said that if you, you you know, you see someone in business and you see them with a, you know, flashy car and this, this and that. They've either been in business 30 years or they're going broke <laughs> because there's somebody that's living too soon beyond their means. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, you've got to, I think someone has a fallacy that when you start a business, you're not going to be making that um, that instant certain lifestyle that you imagine is it isn't going to happen right away mm-hmm. like and if it is then god bless maybe you had a great idea and boom it hit right off the bat but mm-hmm. usually when you're starting from scratch or if it's a a unique idea and you know a lot of restaurant tours and you know a lot of of of, of, of people it, it takes time jeff it, mm-hmm. it it takes time and, and a lot of times it isn't that it isn't even that you have a bad product or a bad idea. You sometimes run out of capital. Yeah. So then you have sometimes have to, I say, sell your soul, so to speak. Not so, but you need to get investors, or you need, and so now you don't. You've given away a, a chunk of your business mm-hmm. to survive, right? Yeah. Knock on wood. We were lucky mm-hmm. that 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 didn't happen, mm-hmm. you know, because it's tough, you know, because you know, you're struggling, you're struggling. And then, and that's not a bad idea. Cause then maybe some investment or some, uh, you know, good silent partner sometimes can get you to that next level. Yeah. But, um, if you can, it's always good to be able just to keep it, uh, in your own backyard, so mm-hmm. to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we touched on this earlier was the, I, the idea of like pro sports opening up doors. And when you said that, I was like, it's kind of, it goes to that idea around community. How does that fit into what you guys so, built? So community is is a big part of what we do. So growing up, uh, when I when, I, when we all played uh, community sports and high school sports, there was always uh, what 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 makes Calgary such a great place is such huge corporate um, support for for kids and for teams and for most charities in general. But you know, when I played soccer, there was always somebody's parents or parents that, you know, would step up and maybe help out with, you know, everybody did whatever they could, you know, help uh, sponsorships or, or what have you. Right. And so you see all this generosity when, with all the teams that you've played on from, from corporate Calgary, when you're in an opportunity to do that, it's just a natural fit to want to, to give back to, 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 to provide the same opportunities that were provided for you. And now you don't do it with the, um, intention of 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 uh reaping benefits mm. for it other than just wanting to help but indirectly you get you get, you know it, it it uh you get you get some good karma you know mm. it uh it, it, you know and, uh, and so i think you know we're we're known as a as a company that's involved in the community and especially when when covid hit it was um it felt so much love 
from people saying, hey, you know, you were there for us and now we're here for you guys. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We're mm -hmm. loyal to you guys and, and, and stuff like that. So that was really moving is that, um, you know, uh, people don't forget when you, you're, you're there to, you know, to help them. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, that's what I love about this city. Like, I think Calgary is one of the one of the one of the places where, if you you, you want to give it a good shot, it, 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 the entrepreneurs entrepreneurism is embraced, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's that it's that uh, Western mentality, like you know, these self a lot of self made people here in Calgary. That mm -hmm. uh, doesn't mean that uh, you know if you want to you know go and 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 uh, work in in um, in any fields like you know medicine or fire department or the place, whatever you want to do, whatever you like, you know, but if you want to be an entrepreneur, I think this is a city where if you give it everything you got and you provide good service and you have a good product, people are going to support you. There isn't jealousy here. Even other, other food people, uh, support because we, we love supporting other people. Like, you know, the more great places there are in Inglewood to come and eat, it makes the whole community better. Cause mm -hmm. you know, someone's isn't going to come to our place every day. Right. You want to, you know, have three, five, six, 10 awesome places. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and mm -hmm. so we find that even in the food industry, everybody is so supportive of everybody. Cause mm -hmm. you know what? Animosity, jealousy, and that stuff doesn't get you anywhere, man. It just eats at your soul. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I feel like the people that, that, um, act on that kind of energy they don't they don't look as they don't look at the opportunity as abundant you know they don't they don't look exactly at, they, they're very singular and they just kind of they feel that competition's a negative yeah no it uh and competition's competition's great and it's not even really competition it's 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 uh it's comp i looked at it as compliments right because mm -hmm. you know one place is a burger place and we're a sandwich and sausage place and another place is a vegan and another place is a breakfast place and another place is chinese and another mm -hmm. place is tacos like it's uh it's awesome mm -hmm. like it's uh you know it just it just it, it makes the whole community vibrant yeah. and uh and a lot of times uh like like what's amazing is there's this awesome little store down the street from us, the blue store. And, and they do some wicked, uh, Korean barbecue and they do some sushi and, and you know, on the weekends, the, the gentleman there buys our, our sandwiches. Cause he knows that after we're closed, um, maybe somebody still wants a, a sandwich. So that's pretty cool when you got somebody down the, down the street from you yeah. that, 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 um, you know, wants to still keep, um, you know, uh, promoting you and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the kind of community we live in. Just wonderful mm -hmm. for people down there in Inglewood and, and the whole city. Um, could you have ever seen this play out this way? Like when the three of you guys are, <laughs> you know, you go back to this, this story of like three dudes cranking out in the basement and, and long hours and not getting, not making money. Could you have ever pictured where it is today? At, at, at that time in 92, no, because I think what we did and what helped us kind of achieve was like, okay, you know, by 19, let's say 95, 96, we want to be here. So I don't think we ever, I don't think we ever uh, were going to accept the fact that we would um, have to shut down, but we just made achievable goals. Mm -hmm. So, so once we got to this step, then it was like, okay, now we're able to start paying ourselves. Okay, what's the next step? So the next step is, okay, we need a bigger facility. And then it's like, okay, let's uh, let's pay off a big chunk of our debt. And then now, hey, let's um, let's buy some new truck, like you know, some new company mm -hmm. vans. Mm -hmm. Let's um, let's uh, you know, hey, maybe we maybe it's time to take a bonus or mm -hmm. you know, let's let's go on a nice holiday or something like that. And yeah. and and so I think we just set achievable goals. Mm -hmm. I don't think we in '92 we just sat there and thought, okay. You know, 32 years from now, we're going to have this big because it, it was just, it was too big to comprehend, mm. you know? So I think we just, um, to, to survive, I think we just made, just set uh, attainable goals. Mm. So I think that is a key, especially when you're struggling or you're not making anything, set something so that you can have a victory. So for example, let's say you're getting killed in a game. So the first half you're killed. So the coach comes in and says, look, we're down you know, 35 points. I don't care if we win or not. Let's just win the third quarter mm -hmm. and then let's win the fourth quarter. So then let's say you end up still losing 35, 21. Yeah. You can still take away, you know what? We, we, we came back and we won mm -hmm. the second half. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so that's kind of, I think what we did is we said, okay, let's uh, pay all our bills Let's let's survive to the point uh, where okay we can start taking mm -hmm. some money. Now that we're actually making some money, let's try and um, expand our food service or our catering. And now oh, there's a piece of land there. 
you know, let's uh, let's try and get a federal facility built there so now we can go after, you know, the co-ops yeah. and all that stuff. And then once we got that all done, then, okay, let's get some better distribution. Let's build some better relationships mm-hmm. and let's do some, some even bigger catering and let's mm-hmm. do, you know, and... I also have to say uh, thank you to the to the media. Like what we're doing here is amazing, and 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 like the radio because of football mm-hmm. had a strong relationship with uh, Jerry Forbes. Okay, you know Jerry, big Jerry, <laughs> right? And so so back in the day, um, you see Jay. Uh, all media was great with us. Like yeah. all, all, all the all. I, so I, I don't want to like other uh, media outlets to be disappointed. But we had this really, Jerry and I had this really close, uh, and still are. We're really good friends, and so they used to always push the the parameters, which was my kind of sense of humor and and stuff. And so, for probably you know fifteen, almost twenty years. I had this unofficial character on on CJ Giuseppe the the truck driver. Oh, I forgot. About <laughs> so, that. so 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 we 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 used to do that every every morning. We used to do that every morning from um, from the um, uh, from the. Uh, the back of the old deli, like you know, Jerry would phone like at five forty-five, and you know, hey Tone, uh, you got something? Oh yeah, yeah. So, but you know how it all started. So we would have Mike and I would have CJ playing on there. Tommy, well, we'd make the sausage, and Tom would go off, and and then Mike and I would continue, and and so Jerry'd be on there, and um, he had this thing, you know, forbidden languages, and so he would have a language where they said something borderline. And if you phoned in and guessed what they were saying, you won a prize. So one day it was Italian. And in Italian, um, the guy goes, a fatto pivitu. And uh, in Italian means, did you fart? And so people are phoning in and they're getting it wrong. So I, 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 I got his direct list. So I phone in and I, and I put on this accent. I go, hey, hello, Mr. Forbe. Uh, those people no, no understand the language. Uh, the person say, uh, he fart. You know, he uh, scorreggio, he fart. He goes, just a minute. He goes, Tony, is that you? I go, yeah. He goes, okay, let's go with this. So we started going with it. And then one thing led to another. And, you know, and then it was like working with my dad, right? Because they were all Italians working at, at, at Rolly Mix. Mm-hmm. And so they were just developing the Northeast back then in the late 70s, early 80s, right? And so we'd uh, we'd get in their truck. I'd be, you know, riding around with my dad. And all of a sudden over the radio, a guy would go, hey, John, uh, is that a wall ready in fucking Ridge? <laughs> I go, Dad, Falcon Ridge? He go, Yeah, that's what I said, Falcon Ridge. <laughs> so I would use that stuff and and do it on on the air. And the way we got around it with the CRTC was Jerry would go, Falcon Ridge. You know what I mean? And uh, some of the stuff we got away with back then, Dude, uh, Jeff, it was I like, can't believe I forgot about <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Sokomi Beach. You remember <laughs> oh, we did that? <laughs> Lake Minnewanka, Cock Ring. You know what I mean? Like we used to, we used to get away with um, so much stuff. And so. It was just these, uh, and then and then we did a whole bunch of, um, you know, uh, CJ is such a uh, Jerry's all about kids and about mm. charities and that, and so we did a whole bunch of uh, a bunch of fun st- stuff together mm. with other other like like they came up with these unbelievable ideas like the backyard barbecues or the early morning uh, breakfasts where you know communities would compete to donate coats or whatever. And then CJ would, would give them uh, prizes and then you know, do a barbecue in the community. Mm-hmm. And, and then we would go and I would go and, and, and barbecue, you know, mm-hmm. with, with Jerry and we meet all these yep. people. And, and it, it, it was such a, again, community, mm-hmm. right? And, and it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we just had a, a blast doing that stuff. Mm-hmm. So we were so blessed. But again, the, the all the sports guys, you know, being... Five minutes from the dome, a lot of the hockey people would, you know, would come over, yeah. you know, just being in, in Inglewood, you know, knowing all the, um, you know, old sportscasters and that, you know, like uh, they're all good friends and mm-hmm. stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I was so lucky with, you know, um, Grandpa, like Mike Lonsborough and uh, Joe Sports. They were kind enough. I used to do some sports at 11 uh, mm-hmm. with those guys, you, you know, that? and, and uh, so they just opened a lot of doors because, you know, when people are seeing you and you're able to talk. Even if you're not talking about your business, yeah. you know what I mean? It gives your business exposure. And we For were sure. so blessed to have that. Or, you know, it wasn't a, there's something about this that's magical because this is organic, but we're talking like two friends here. It isn't a, 
a rehearsed paid yeah. uh, spot. You, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. These 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 really nice conversations, or uh, you're you're having some fun, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. They they just come across. People tend to listen to that. Where if you're listening to an ad, sometimes you know what I mean. They just yeah. kind of right. They yeah, just kind of sure. they got you know. It's an ad, right? It's yeah. like whatever. Yeah. So uh, yeah, those those like those reads, right? Where you're like reading off the script. You're like, come down on Fridays yeah, yeah, for yeah, like for, half for, price, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, it's like. Man. It's funny as you as you remember these stories. I'm like having these just wild <laughs> flashbacks, which yeah, it goes back a long time. It, it, it does, and 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 you, and you have such a uh, uh, so many wonderful people, uh, like you said, that journey. Mm -hmm. And and the best part is our staff, Jeff. What makes Palumbo's is our staff, and I feel we're like a university because in '92, um, I had a group of, of people, and then and um, there was just us, and then we had like employee one or two and then you know they they grew up from school and then they got married you know married or moved on and then you had another wave of of kids for five years and another wave so in 32 years we've probably had six i call them graduating classes mm -hmm. and and a lot of our our graduates from spalumbos they're teachers now or they're Amazing. they're doctors they're lawyers they're policemen they're fire you know they're and, and you know, be part of their lives for a certain period, and and a lot of them were athletes because we were athletes too. And athletes are great um, kids to have because they're driven and they're focused, and uh, you know. And so, and now, um, Jeff, what's beautiful is we're getting a lot of these new Canadians, wonderful people from mm -hmm. Central and South America, from Ukraine. These beautiful young people that they remind me so much of my mom and dad, like mm -hmm. so much, like my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Like my mom and dad were. <laughs> you know, 50 years ago yeah. were these wonderful young people that are coming from Central and South America or from Ukraine or, you know, Africa and stuff that are looking for opportunities and mm. they're just wonderful. And so having all these wonderful people, you know, you know, having that team concept, yeah. um, uh, we're really, we're really blessed. Our staff is amazing. Mm. Uh, this has been really cool, man. And no, thank, like, thank, thank you, Jeff. I, it's an honor to be here to talk to you. You know, thank you. Um, I end the show with one question. You touched on this earlier. When I say Calgary, where yeah. does your head go? Um, Calgary. Um, my head goes to um, um, care. Hmm. People here care. People here help. People here um, smile. You know, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, this is my home. Um, uh, you know, e even though I like to, to see different, uh, places, uh, you know, um, but I'm so happy this is my home. There's a reason why the sun shines here 300 out of the 365 days. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's basically emblematic of the, the people that, that, that live here. So, uh, my whole life, not only did my family care, my neighbors cared, my coaches cared, mm. uh, you care, you know what I mean? It's mm. like uh, mm. people here, uh, they care mm. about each other. Uh, amazing. Um, thanks for taking the time. No, thank you. This thanks is so much. Like, dude, I, obviously, I, I'm born and raised Calgarian. I know I know your name, been to your restaurant a <laughs> lot, so it's just cool to have this experience and like no, hear, hear um, the story. No, thank you, Jeff. And uh, for me, this was like we'd known each other, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was just uh, such a, a thrill to be able to, to relive that because sometimes you know mm -hmm. it um mm -hmm. you don't remember it as much you say you get so caught up i'm, I'm sure you a lot of people have probably told you that that when they're sitting here you get so caught up um you know trying to get to the finish line that you yeah. forget the journey right totally. and uh so today you're out you were able to help me uh relive the journey mm -hmm. and and thank you for that yeah it's really cool and uh thanks for blankhorn for setting this up all right Polly, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no appreciate it thanks, thanks for Paul. your time yeah thank you